if we don't understand what counts as stress, we don't understand that that is one more stressor <laughs> that we're adding. <laughs> Yes, And that's the total opposite of what we need to be doing when we've crashed, when we've hit that wall, when we flooded the system. Um, of course, we feel bummed. You know, of course, we're kind of upset. We're like, oh, man, I just pushed it a little bit too much. But if we start that negative self-talk more in that place, it's just going to be more stress. And the name of the game at that point is less stress because you've got to lower that stress before you can start to come out of that crash. Welcome, Heather Davis. Thank you so much for being on the Dr. Tina show. I know you to be a registered dietitian with NutriSense, who is a podcast sponsor of mine and a product that I absolutely love. And you were sent my way because we're going to talk about stress and sleep. And then I come to find out that you have this background in neuroendocrine expertise and central sensitization, which I've talked about a lot on my podcast. So I'm super excited to have you here. Can you introduce yourself to the audience, please? Yes, Dina, thanks so much for having me. And hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, like Dr. Tina said, we're going to talk about stress and a lot of the physiology behind the stress response system in the body, how that could impact glucose, metabolic health. It's really a topic that I think it offers endless opportunity to explore, really. You can just talk about this for days and days. And it's something that my career has focused more on. I've worked with a lot of people who do have sort of that central sensitization background in their medical history, whether they've been diagnosed with things like PTSD, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, you know, adrenal fatigue, stuff like this. We see all of that kind of in that umbrella. So I work with a lot of those folks and also just focused in women's health in general as well. So Awesome. There's a lot of fun stuff we can talk about. Yes, I'm so excited. Most people don't understand this concept of central sensitization. And I describe it just simply as wind up pain phenomenon where the nervous system basically gets, and this is a really kindergarten version, of course, but just when I'm talking to patients and my audience, it's, you know, your nervous system gets wound up and it gets crossed. So a good example is a mechanoreceptor, something that would normally register pressure or light touch actually starts registering pain. And so things get kind of wonky inside the cord and in the brain. And now this person is cued for pain is, you know, kind of the sort of primed up for it. And the microglial cells in the brain get involved and it's this whole downstream effect. And I, I just, it's so great that you're here today. Cause I just released a podcast. We were talking offline about this, about how pain is not always structural. And so can you, I'd love to hear your sort of description and how you explain it to people in layman's terms. Yeah. Well, something you said really just stuck out to me, which is this phenomenon of central sensitization doesn't proceed like we would normally think like a healthy body might respond to pressure or stress, or you could just think of broadly, you know, pressure applied to your body. We often think of it that, oh, a healthy body, you apply some pressure, you adapt to that pressure, and then you become more resilient. But with people who struggle with the central sensitization uh, syndrome and collection of syndromes, what can actually happen is the opposite. The more you kind of trigger it, the more sensitized you become, the more you are dialed in to perceive that pain and stress on a lower threshold, which means that all the classic recommendations that we like to tell people, oh, push through the pain or like, you know, build, build it up by working through it, leaning into it. That's going to backfire for a lot of these people because it's actually going to push them deeper into wind up. So, and deeper into that activation. So it's such a careful dance of like knowing how to back off at the right times, knowing what stress tolerance really is and not pushing too far past your limit. So it's, it's really interesting, but I think what's cool to also start with is just trying to define what stress even really is. And I think a lot of people maybe have like, a misunderstanding of what it is or an oversimplified um, idea of what it is. Because when I say, oh, I'm so stressed out, 
I think most people immediately assume, well, that's just like the classic psychosocial stressors, your job stress, maybe you had an argument with a loved one, things like that. And those are definitely stressors, which are deeply physiological, right? We say psychosocial, but they physically impact you, but they're just a small piece of the pie of stress because we actually have stress coming in from nutritional imbalances, that's a stress, from uh, food intolerances, that's a stress. If you aren't fueling well for your exercise, right? If you're pushing through your exercise, but you're not fueling well for your exercise, that can be a big (laughs) stress. (laughs) It's my guilty, yes, I get that one. (laughs) And we all test those limits, right? And I think um, another important thing to just pause and also mention is that not all stress is bad. Like stress in itself is really a very neutral concept. It's really just a pressure applied to, in our case, the body. So whether or not it ends up being helpful or harmful really depends on the dose and in the context, the medical context and the health history of that individual. So the amount of stress you might apply to person A, and they do great, they are do, they adapt to it, it's fine. You apply the same amount to person B and they get overloaded, right? And they their system crashes. So yeah. you're like, well, what's this about? It's, you gotta really see it from that individual context. It's so true. And it's a Goldilocks thing. So it's like doing nothing. You know, I lived in this, I have central sensitization for the audience listening, for anyone who's new here, but my followers know this. It, when I did nothing movement wise, I was, it was horrible. Like I was in horrific pain. If I do too much, I'm in horrific pain. So there's this medium ground, right? Where I have to find my perfect spot and I sometimes overdo it. And there's factors that I don't, I can't always control for. Like last night, for some odd reason, I had insomnia. So I was up until God knows what time. And I only got about three and a half hours of sleep. I have a pretty heavy workout scheduled for later today. I'm going to have to tell my coach, we're going to have to back off and chill. Cause like that will send me over the edge. Right. So just knowing what that is and then being comfortable there. I always say to folks, I saw a lot of these folks in my practice and I mean, that's pretty much, I specialized in pain and I would always say it's going to hurt before it gets better. It's going to probably get worse before it gets better, but there's this And finding somebody to work with, I think is critical when it comes to movement, when it comes to your nutrition, when it comes to all the factors, it's just the fact that we need to find folks to help guide us because we have to do something. And a lot of these folks I find do want to do nothing because, you know, we we could talk about long COVID or post-viral syndrome or any of these other phenomenons that I think really kick off a lot of this central sensitization trauma. It could be a car accident that just sent someone over the edge. It could be a husband died, it sent him over the edge. I mean, it could be a variety of things, but it's so important to test our own boundaries and just expect. Sometimes I might have a really heavy deadlift day and I'm like, you know what? This is probably going to send me over the edge and I have to be the gauge there, but I would never know unless I worked up to the edge of that boundary myself. Does that make sense? Like I have to swim to the edge of the pool to know where the edge is. (laughs) And that's why I tell people the same thing too. You've got to You've got to understand that hitting those walls is a part of the process, finding your boundaries is a part of the process, and those boundaries will change over time. And as you get stronger, as you heal, those boundaries get pushed out further, you know, so something that was kind of your stress tolerance threshold last year, it might go up a little bit more this year as you've done that deeper healing work. Um, but what you said about that middle zone, the spectrum of not doing enough and then doing too much and finding that middle zone. I love that because that's the key. The, I think the tendency for so many people is an all or nothing thinking a black or white thinking. If this makes me feel good, I'm going to do it all day, every day. Wrong. (laughs) You know, dial it back a little bit, but if this makes me feel bad, I never want to do it okay, well, maybe not that either. Somewhere in the middle is the answer. But the cool thing is um, your body can give you all those answers and can help you gauge the process of that recovery. 
but you just have to know how to read the symptoms. You have to know how to do the proper tolerance tests along the way. And I do a lot of this with the folks that I work with. Um, and we kind of set up these, these tolerance assessment tests as we go. And over time, you know, they really do say, wow, this is amazing. Like I couldn't do X, Y, Z last month or three months ago, and now I can. And so it's really about being patient with the body as it feels as, you know, it's a process. It really is. And you nailed it. It's just 1% better every day. I just try to do 1% better every day. And I've gotten very comfortable with the fact that I may backslide. Like I just had a flare recently and it was a culmination of issues. It was stress. It was lack of sleep. It was overworking. I had a whole project get thrown on me that I was not anticipating in the middle of trying to get a bunch of other stuff done. I was not eating at home. Like I have to be super careful about what I put in my mouth. And I was eating out. I was getting seed oils. I was getting, you know, whatever. And boom, I woke up and I was like, oh, frick, here's, yeah. here it is. And I never know how long it's going to be. And I never know how severe it's going to be, but I have the tools. I have learned the tools through really honing into my own body. I know how to get myself back on track. And so yeah. instead of freaking out, like I used to, and like going into the downward spiral, which I feel so bad for folks who are there. Cause so many people are there. I think, especially post COVID, I think COVID in particular was a virus that really sent a lot of people kind of over the edge. They were already yeah. on, you know, like yeah. whether it was menopause or into adrenal dysfunction or whatever, it was like, boop, <laughs> they got, yeah. you know, sort of thrown over that edge. And I think a lot of folks are actually dealing with some central sensitization and I, no one's talking about it, but I'm hearing about it from my followers. You're probably hearing about it with your clients. And I think we're going to have an actual epidemic pain situation on our hands due to what everything of what just happened. Needless to say, um, pain and chronic fatigue, they're going to, they're going to, it's going to be epidemic. I know I've been saying it too. I'm like, give it a few more years and this is going to be all we're seeing in the clinic. Yep. Yep. And it's really rough because, well, I'm grateful I have the tools I have and I can dial myself back in. A lot of it's just lifestyle. Some of it's some biohacking stuff. Like, you know, I have a sauna and I have access to maybe a PEMF mat and there's different tools I use, but knowing that I can, I can dial it back in as needed. I can manage it is so powerful. And it starts with me forgiving myself. Like, Instead of coming down on myself, because I'm if this, I think this is more prevalent in type A's as well, right? Like we, <laughs> we drive ourselves into the ground instead of really coming down on myself and saying, damn it, Tina, you did all these things wrong and blah, 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 which is what I used to do. Now I'm like, okay, it's here we are. Um, I have a funny immune system. I'm going to step this back. I'm going to forgive myself. I'm going to rest like permission to take naps all day, every day, if I need to, but yeah. get my ass up and go for a walk in between, right? Like it's balance. I can't just lay on the couch and rot. I did that for 10 years. It was terrible. And so now I choose to build strength and resiliency, but for each person out there listening, cause I know I have a lot of followers and I hear this a lot. Well, what about this? And what about the people who can't get up? I'm like, I remember crawling to the bathroom to use oh, yeah. it. And oh, like, yeah. at some point you decide if you're going to get back up or not. Right. So oh, yeah. That's you my and I rant. have been in those places where, I mean, we at the bottom of the barrel where you're just struggling to do basic activities of, of daily life. And I think that what you said about beating yourself up is important because if we don't understand what counts as stress, we don't understand that that is one more stressor <laughs> that we're adding. <laughs> yes, And that's the total opposite of what we need to be doing when we've crashed, when we've hit that wall, when we flooded the system. Um, of course we feel bummed you know of course we're kind of upset we're like oh man I just pushed it a little bit too much but if we start that negative self-talk more in that place it's just going to be more stress and the name of the game at that point is less stress because you've got to lower that stress before you can start to come out of that crash and so I really think about it like very simply as an equation the demand that you place on your body so all those different stressors poor sleep of alcohol, maybe a lot of stimulants like caffeine that we're using to kind of get through the day if we're not eating well or we're taxing our bodies, right? And we're just sort of blowing through it. Uh, poor nutrition, all these things we talk about that count as stress. That demand that we place on our body needs to be equal 
to the reserves that we have to adapt to that demand. So that means that like what you were talking about where you noticed, oh, I didn't sleep well last night. That means that's a stressor, right? Yeah. Now you've increased your demand. Now, if you ramp up your intense workout, now you've just increased your demand even more. And that reserves is low because sleep also helps you replenish your reserves. So you're doing that equation balancing just by being like, okay, I'm going to dial back my workouts today. You just yes. that, right? And so when we have this stress side, this demand side pile up and we're not replenishing, we're not resting, we're not balancing our nutrition, we're not doing a lot of the things that allow for that parasympathetic nervous system activation, the rest and digest activation, right? We're not doing that, but we're just piling this up. That's when you get chronic illness, imbalance, all sorts of breakdown in the neuroendocrine system or stress response system in the body pain syndromes, fatigue syndromes, all the rest of it, because it's very simple. The body doesn't have enough resources to meet the pressure that you're placing on it. So you've yes. got to off. Yes. You know? I love that. That's such a wonderful, wonderful explanation for people. It's these folks, much like myself, and maybe like you tend to just keep driving the train at full speed and they're begging me as their physician to throw hormones at them and to throw, yeah. do these injections to make their joint pain stop and all this stuff. And I'm like, yo, first of all, these injections are all regenerative, meaning they're contingent on your body's ability to heal. There's nothing in my syringe. It's like the magic is in either in your own blood or in the sugar water I'm putting in you and your body's responding to it. If there's nothing there, right? So my steps, honestly, when, like when this happened the other week, I cleared my schedule. I fortunately have built, I have built a business that I can do that. I was very intentional. I knew by the time I hit 45 that I needed to have that adaptability in my schedule. So I can clear my schedule if I need to. It sucks because I have to make up for it later, but Hey, you know, if you got to rest, you got to rest. I take naps every single day, every single day. I just go lay down. I'm like a toddler. It's like, okay, Tina's time to go lay down now. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's a really, it can be such a healthy practice. I wish our society was more supportive of just like a time to really be restful, you know, at, at a certain point in the day. Oh, I miss the, you know, in kindergarten, we'd pulled out the cots and we'd all lay down. I, ah, I miss when that went away. I used we never to... appreciated it back then. Did we? I was never, I, now I'm like, okay, yes. <laughs> I loved it. I, in high school, I used to, I was so burned out hormonally by high school that I, and from stress that I ended up going to the nurse's office every day at lunch. This is so sad. Every day at lunch, I'd go to the nurse's office to go take a nap because yeah. I was so just flatline. But anyway, I digress. So yeah, I'll lay down that laying down. It might be 10 minutes in the sun. It might be 10 minutes of quiet time on the couch or on my pemf mat. It might be, I might just literally set my alarm for 15 minutes and I'm out. I'm just, I'm a good sleeper. I'm out. I wake up when the alarm dings and I get up and I go for a walk, you know, permission to rest is such a huge aspect huge. in all of this. And I think that, I mean, we're, we're supposed to be talking about blood sugar here. So we'll get to, I have a, <laughs> I have oh, we'll a, get to it. <laughs> But I think that that's something that our society is missing. And even if it just means going in the back, I know a lot of us are at work and we can't necessarily do that, but is there a quiet place to go sit in your car? A lot of folks will do that. They'll find a few minutes to go sit in their car. Uh, they might go in the break room. If you really, if you can double down and like lay down and put your feet up on the wall, I think that's a huge, huge benefit for people too, that is undervalued. So whatever yeah, I agree with that. Whatever Definitely. people can do to just rest, because I don't know about you, but I'm the girl that it's kind of scary. I'll be out in public in a social situation, or I'll be out even by myself traveling. I've, this has happened. And it happened in Central Park in the middle of January in 21 degree weather. I literally can't move anymore and I have to lay down. And so I'll lay my head on my, like, if I'm with my husband, I'll lay my head on his lap and I'll say, wake me up in 10 minutes. Like, I can't, I'm going to die. I'm so tired, yeah. but like, I have to lie down. <laughs> yeah. But it, it happens sometimes when I'm alone, which is scary, but it's like, I have to lie down right now. And I try to stay awake, but I'm just sharing this so the audience understands. Cause they, sometimes people come at me and they're like, you don't understand anything. You're perfect. You're, you know, you think you're so perfect. And I'm like, no, you have no idea what I endure because 
sometimes we just have to rest and we can't keep driving a, an empty engine, like you said. Yeah. Well, I love that you know your limits and you know when you need that time and you pull the plug because what gets so many of us into trouble over time is, is pushing through that. And you're not really allowing the body to ever rebuild that balance in the equation. And that is going to come with a high, high cost over time. So yeah, I think most of what I end up working with people on is actually just the acceptance that yes, you are a mortal. Yes, you do <laughs> yeah. rest a little bit here and there. Like, yeah. It's very hard for people to set boundaries. It's very hard for people to say no. It's very hard for people to give themselves permission to rest, like you're saying. So there's so much like just advocating around that, that goes a long way. And of course we could go off and talk about how this relates to larger cultural productivity obsessions and all this other stuff that, that as a culture we're pushed into uh, and made to feel guilty often if we are, you know, not doing enough or um, slacking off, right? We lose touch with those natural rhythms that we need to be uh, in sync with a lot more. And yeah, comes at a high price. It's true. And it does not age well. It, you know, it was cute in my twenties. I could pull it off. I mean, I was a basket case for real. I was a basket case in my twenties and I was a disaster of health. And then in my thirties, I just, you know, I was a, I'm a force of nature. So I'm, you know, I'm doing like the chiropractic and the naturopathic program at the same time. I'm a single mom and I'm crushing it. Right. And I just, and I hurt all the time <laughs> though. I hurt all the time. I looked great. I hurt all the time get to my forties, start getting chronic pneumonia, can't shake it. It's on and on and on. And finally, like I had to give up my practice. That's a huge reason I gave up yeah. my practice is I was having a lot of success in a lot of different places. And I basically was like, what is, where can I make the most amount of money and have the absolute most freedom to rest? Mm -hmm. That was really my decision. And that took practice right out. And I was very successful in practice, but I'm like, I'm making way more online and I can rest. <laughs> Yeah, as rest, needed. I can rest. sleep in. I can go to bed early if I want. I can take a nap in the middle of the day. Like I can pull the plug as needed. And like I said, I built this life for this very much for this reason, not as a, um, some people say, oh, well, you know, did you, did you cut your practice and go online so that you could sort of like coddle your chronic illness? And I'm like, no, that's not it at all. It's just, I don't mm -hmm. have as much chronic illness when I'm not burning the candle yeah, no, at all ends, you know, thing, right. All you're doing is actually respecting your body's limits and living within that. And that should be something, um, that we all strive for. And I wish that society supported more. Yeah. People don't realize that some of us just will. And I say this, you guys know who you are to the listeners. You, you light all the candles at both ends and then you put new wicks up. You light those <laughs> wicks from every end and ends that aren't even ends. <laughs> and you burn the, eventually you burn the house down, you burn the foundation down and it starts to show, it might not show, you know, necessarily show itself physically on the outside yet, but this does not age well. And this leads to a whole host of miserable, not only chronic pain, but miserable hormonal disruption. And then ultimately, I, truly, I think people burn themselves into diabetes. Yeah. Like, so when you, I, I mean, absolutely. We do have like a lot of great research that has looked at allostatic load or stress load and prediabetes and diabetes risk. And as we see that stress and chronic stress level rise, we absolutely see risk for prediabetes and diabetes go up. I mean, it's very well established. And so there's that piece. And I think also one thing that always stands out to me when I work with this group of people who usually, um, you know, I see a lot of people in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s who are finally being rendered completely debilitated by things that they honestly were getting warning signs about in their late teens and twenties and thirties. Um, you know, but they weren't able to really understand what those warning signs were and what to do with them. So I think a lot of what I'm passionate about is educating people on those warning signs, what to look for, 
how to really understand your body's language of stress and how to take them seriously. I think especially as women, we're often given the message that it's in our head or (laughs) you're blowing it out of proportion. But in reality, I think women are often more in tune with with their body and things that they're kind of taught not to pay attention to over time, uh, taught out of it, you know, I know I was, and it can lead to then ignoring all of these warning signs and then getting the bill big time later on. And often as you cross into menopause, right, as the body is already dealing with these stressors leading up and then menopause just tips you right over and you're like, I don't understand. I gained all this weight and I feel horrible and I'm fatigued and this came out of nowhere. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. <laughs> yep. I've been cooking on the back burner for a while. And, um, but like you said, it can, for some people happen faster. If you've had a really intense trauma, uh, like if somebody has gone through, um, I see this like a really bad car accident or a really intense emotional trauma, a loss, a grief, um, that can sometimes be a big enough hit that it can really expedite that dial and push it, you know, a lot further. So we do see that. That's a huge one. That's what I always try to get to when I do a new patient intake is what was that thing, right? Like, because I always look at it from, it's like a triangle, right? We've got our genetics and epigenetics. We've got all of the years up until now. How are you feeding yourself? How are you living? How are your relationships? How has your stress been? Um, I mean, God, some people are just married to people they hate and in jobs for decades, they hate, right? Like this, this whole thing. And then there's the trigger, the third yeah, that the, straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. It's often viral. I found in practice, it's often viral. That's why this whole focus on long hauler syndrome, I'm like, join the club, like post viral. Oh, yeah. Hello. Nice to see you. We've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> yeah. For decades. <laughs> yeah. We've been getting gaslit for decades. I'm glad people are paying attention now, but yeah. And it will manifest into these chronic pain syndromes often. And that to me is the harbinger. And I, you nailed it. It started for me actually in pregnancy, that was yeah. a big enough hormonal pregnancy shift. For a lot of people, Tina, I see it for a lot of people. It's a very stressful process on the body. Yeah. And I was not prepared for it. I was that kid that was like, you know, I went vegetarian, vegan. So I said when I was 14, basically became a mac and cheese itarian, turned into a massive, you know, refined carbohydrate addict, addict yeah. lived off all the ultra refined carbs that I could get my in my mouth, completely destroyed my gut biome. <laughs> with oh, yeah, it. Yeah. And that, and you know, prior to that was antibiotics my whole life. So, you know, no biome really going into this and then very malnourished. And that's a huge one here. So yeah. you mentioned it, not fueling your workouts. I say just not fueling your life. That's one of not the first things. Not fueling thing. your life. Huge. It's, it's the huge. One thing. It's why, it's why I went into nutrition because when, um, when I went through my decades long healing process, uh, personally, it was the nutrition piece that I found to be, um, the most impactful. And when I, when I discovered that after really, truly trying everything under the sun and realizing how much I had underestimated the nutrition piece, it was so eye opening to me. I went into practice after school and immediately started to work with all of these people who had kind of been like me, you know, they'd been in that overloaded, extremely debilitated place diagnosed with all kinds of things. And nutrition was a huge piece for all of them. I witnessed absolutely incredible recoveries, like people bed bound, able to have their life back, you know, running marathons like this was, and they had been doing all kinds of things, but they hadn't, they, and they, of course, thought they had done nutrition, right? You know, they'd been like, well, I tried this diet and I tried that diet. I was like, throw out all that crap. This is about what's going to work for you. And we've got to build a custom diet for you. And that's where the power of nutrition is. It's in the customization. It's not in any of the fad stuff. It's not in, it's not in, that might sometimes get your foot in the door for a minute, but the lasting stuff, the stuff that's really going to be with you for the long haul and see you through a serious recovery is going to be a customized approach. I agree completely. I am so glad to hear you say that. It's very challenging as a quote unquote influencer, which I never planned on being, but everybody wants me to take a blanket approach to 
nutrition and they want to know what side I'm on. Like you said, people can't yeah. handle nuance. It's black or white. <laughs> are you carnivore? Are you this? And I'm like, yo, I've been eating the same way for decades <laughs> and it's very low carb and it is very protein, animal protein heavy. And I've recently converted most of that animal protein to more of a beef based ruminant animal diet. I feel so much better that way. I eat my egg yolks. I don't fear fat. I never have. I've never counted macros. I eat sweet things when I feel like it. It's usually I try to find a natural form like fruit, but there is no name for this. And I can't say that this will work for everyone. And so people right. want, they want guides and they want me to do podcasts about it and they want details. And I'm like, this is not for everyone. This is for yeah. me. And this is how my body runs. And I feel best here. Like the first thing I thought of when I got up this morning was, well, fuck, I only got three hours of sleep. That's not good. I have a big day. And then the second thing I thought was Tina, you better feed yourself well today. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, <laughs> like exactly. When that stress load is coming up from other places, you've got to really focus on nutrition to help balance it. Um, yeah. It's popular and it's easy to get followers when you take a really like extreme stance on nutrition. I just don't. So I have put out a guide that is kind of how I call it the how I eat guide. And people still want to come at me and say, well, you said this. And I'm like, I said, that's how I eat. I don't care how you eat. I really <laughs> don't care. Like eat how, whatever makes you feel better, but really getting some data and understanding what your food is doing to you. I think that's why the NutriSense monitor is like game changer, like literally changed my life. Probably the best biohacking. And I've said this before, it's like the best biohacking device I found. And I hate that term, but it really is. It's nice. It gave me so much insight on what the foods were doing to me and what my lifestyle was doing to me. Yeah. And then on top of that, just learning to like cleaning the diet up. And if I could give anyone advice, I'll say what I said to my patients, clean your diet up of all the riffraff so that you can instinctually know what you need. Your taste buds and your body will tell you if your instincts are on, but if you're eating a bunch of garbage all the time and you're living in perpetual stress and you're never exercising, your body will never tell you. So it's like, we're just mammals. We're fancy mammals with opposable thumbs and our bodies know what to do if our instincts are working. But unfortunately in this modern world with blue light and toxins and stress and all the nonsense, we don't have any instinctual dials working in our favor if we're not really trying to hone that. Yeah. yeah I think of that similarly, just, I often say like, you need to turn down the noise. And if you can turn down the noise, because people talk a lot about intuitive eating and I say that is great once you've turned down the noise, but if you're going to try to do intuitive eating in the noise, good luck to you. <laughs> you know, it's going to be it's going to be a crapshoot. So it's like you've got to turn down the noise and then um, and realize kind of what counts as the noise and all everything you just described. So yeah, that's so important. If people in this, I think about this a lot, the, before I was with NutriSense, I was in private and I specialized like in these people that we're talking about. And this all, almost all I did for like a decade and in the literally thousands of customized meal plans that I helped build with people, no two were ever exactly alike. And that was such a great lesson for me because it really gave me the opportunity to see that even small changes can make huge difference, huge differences in your outcomes in your diet, right? So following what someone else does that works really great for them, following it to a T is almost definitely not going to be what works for you, right? You right. may even be able to follow 90% of it, but that 10% is actually going where you deviate is actually going to make a big difference on your outcome. So um, the customized piece is just, I really can't emphasize it enough and seeing so many people and how different everyone was, it really made me focus more on developing a system for discovering what diet works as opposed to discovering the diet that works. Yes. So now when people say, well, what diet do you recommend, Heather? I'm like, I don't. I recommend a certain system for discovering your diet, but I don't recommend any single diet ever. I'm like, you may have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, you know, and the way that will come together in the cocktail for you might look completely different than for anyone else, but I can tell you how to figure it out. 
And that's what I've been focused on <laughs> for all these years. But yeah, great learning experience. I've learned so much from all my clients that I've worked with over the years. It's a big, it's a big deal. And it's impossible to make these blanket statements. It's funny. Cause like we were talking before that metabolic health, the basics, you know, the basics that I, the drum I'm always beating, it's not sexy and it's not good for clicks and it's not good for followers. If you don't have a severe stance on things. And then the second you deviate, they come at you and they're like, well, you said this here. And then you said that there. And then you said this and they just don't understand nuance. I'll take alcohol sweeteners as example, alcohol sweeteners. I found in my patients and in myself can cause a lot of gut disruption can cause a lot of diarrhea. So I generally avoid alcohol sweeteners. Now there's a little bit of erythritol in one, some of my products, a little bit, the dose makes the poison though, right? Like it's the small amounts of element is another electrolyte product. I really love. And they have a little bit of stevia. And so I'll make a post about stevia and then suddenly it's this black or white and people black freak or out. White. They freak out. They just freak yeah. out in droves, especially around sweeteners. And here's the funny part to all the people who really want to lose their minds on me. I actually eat sugar. Oh my God. Like I talk about how eating tons of refined sugar is not good for you, but God forbid I eat some sugar and I maybe have like a Mexican Coke or a little bit of table sugar in my coffee just to like dampen my cortisol response. People lose their minds. It's so even my husband, he's like, you're eating sugar. I'm like, yo, I don't have any metabolic syndrome. I actually have such low insulin response that it's a problem. So I'm going to give myself a little bit of this here and there as like, I use, well, I use sugar as a spark. I use it as an energetic cellular spark, not when I'm dragging because I need energy because I haven't done anything. It's more like, hey, I need to go work out. I'm going to put a little sweetener in here with some salts and I'm going to give myself a, or I'll have some fruit, you know, something to give myself yeah. a, a spark. I think of it as sunshine. I think of it as like ingesting. Sun That's how I think of fruit is <laughs> ingesting, ingesting sunshine. sunshine. So, uh, you know, in moderation, in small amounts, and I come from a long line of diabetics. And so I'm very, very careful with my mm -hmm. sugar intake, but God forbid you say, monitor your sugar and be aware of it. And then everyone takes it as like, don't, you said, don't eat sugar. And oh, it, yeah, anyway, it's just, it's a ridiculous world in this online. It's space. maddening to try to have a message of nuance, isn't it? To, <laughs> yes. to really have, it's like that, that is the thing that at times makes me want to pull out all my hair is just <laughs> not ever being able to have the message of nuance embraced. <laughs> it's like, you know, an endless struggle, but what you're saying about the dose is everything. Like I always tell people if, if I were to try to get close to a dietary philosophy in a generic term, I would say, I want for people to have the most variety and the most diversity that they can tolerate, that they can individually handle. So if that means including a lot of different things in small amounts, or, you know, it's, it's not about eliminating vast quantities of food for people. It's really about nuance across the board. It's about balance. It's about taking breaks from things and not doing them the same exact way all the time, all the, you know, every day. And the body responds much better to this kind of pulsed, taking breaks, coming back. Yes. A little bit of this, not eight gallons of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I have a little bit of sugar. Yeah. And it's okay. But I'm also making sure that the dietary pattern overall reflects all these other valuable traits. So the sugar is not a big deal. You know what I mean? But if yes. you eat sugar in high amounts all day long and your overall dietary quality sucks, then yeah, the sugar impact is going to be proportionally far more negative. And then yeah, trouble. <laughs> yeah. You're so right. It's so funny. I was reminded of some patient cases. I you know, it's like you tell a patient you can have a little bit of this and they're like, well, exactly how much is a little bit like their neurosis and OCD kicks in, you know, and you tell them. And I remember telling patients, sure, you can have a little bit of nut butter. And I'm thinking, you know, a tablespoon or two couple like times a week. <laughs> Guy comes back with the most horrific gut issues. He's eating literally a jar of peanut butter every day. And he's wondering why he's all stopped up. Another guy, I tell him, you know, berries are preferable. He was in a, 
Well, here's the thing, and you know this, uh, some people can look at a prune and have an insulin response that's extreme oh, yeah. because their blood sugar is so wrecked. It's so brittle. Right. Like they've, it's been years of stress. And like you said, yeah. they, you know, they've what's led them here and suddenly it's, oh, I have diabetes. It's like, yeah, dude, you've had it for 20 years brewing. Yeah, you've been on the path. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, he was, he got diverticulitis because he was eating just massive quantities of berries every day. And I was like, what? how I've even, but you know, then there's even exercise. I've had patients where I would say I would do a procedure on their back and I would say, okay, you can walk for the next three weeks. You can walk gently and then ease yourself back into exercise. We don't want to mess up the good progress that these injections have given you. And okay, well, I'll walk to my mailbox and back. Great. That sounds awesome. Turns out their mailbox is like four miles away. <laughs> I'm not kidding, you know, or they're like, well, I went on a hike this weekend. It was only 12 miles. And I'm like, oh, good Lord. So I know this, this struggle so well. Yes. Yeah. So you know, I share this with you for laughs because <laughs> this is, I'm sure you've had, you deal with we food can. specifically. So man, people are, they don't understand nuance and they don't understand. I, I don't know what it is. I don't know where humans got, this takes me back to instincts. I agree. We've gotten so far away from even being able to register I mean, it, it's so easy to, again, like launch, launch into kind of a rant on it, but it's true. Like we, when you just look at how a lot of us live in our environment, completely unaware of the impact of our daily decisions on the ecosystem that surrounds us, like your body is a part of that ecosystem. And if you can't kind of feel what's going on, how are you going to be able to figure out what foods are working for you or, or not? Like you're very disconnected and it, it's just, uh, I think, you know, systemic issue. Yes. And disconnected is the word. If we can get them connected back to their bodies, this is why I love movement. Why I'm such a fan. I mean, it's awesome for your blood sugar, but also it gives you a lot of leeway when you have muscle on your body, you have a lot more leeway with carbohydrates, but it puts you back in your body. You have no other choice. And so that helps with everything, right? That helps with all kinds of decisions, particularly around food and nourishing that body because the work you just put in needs to be fed. And that's where I get myself into trouble. You, I put in a good hard workout and then I realize, oh crap, I haven't eaten anything today. Halfway through You're the workout. You're going to hear my voice, Tina. <laughs> <laughs> no, fuel your workout, Tina. Fuel your workout. <laughs> and I should know better, of course, of all people, but you know, we get caught in these traps. So well, let's move into more around the monitor because you and I were talking off- Ooh line, it was so fascinating what you said that you find folks that are kind of in this, bringing it back to the central sensitization, this pain syndrome, that you find these folks are sort of hovering in this hypoglycemic land. Can you, maybe I didn't say that right. Can you explain that and talk more about it? Yeah, you're right. So what I see with a lot of the chronic stress overload pictures that we, we get clinically for people, which look like chronic pain syndromes, chronic fatiguing syndromes, um, a lot of signs that your body is going through some deep dysregulation. So I just want to touch on what that could look like symptom-wise so people can kind of understand what this means. So like we just talked about, you've got all this demand that's built up in your body, right? And your reserves are low. And so your body's trying to compensate, but it's not able to. So it sort of decompensates. And what this means is it starts changing a lot about your daily metabolic regulation in order to conserve energy. It's a very conservation lizard brain approach, very primitive action uh, on the part of the body to conserve resources. So this is why you'll see digestive function get down-regulated or become impaired because Digestion is, it does require energy and it's not a priority when you're running from a tiger. So your body goes, eh, no more digesting food, right? So people start complaining. I've got that chronic digestive stuff, right? That's one. Another one is you start to have hormonal dysregulations and neurotransmitter dysregulations. And you don't need, a, I found you don't need a lot of fancy tests to tell you because your symptoms are going to give this away but it usually comes with like the wired and tired feeling, which is very epinephrine. <laughs> so you've got this, can't really sleep very well, but you're exhausted. You're wired, but you're exhausted. You know, you're sort of agitated, anxious, on edge, 
but you're too fatigued to get out and move your body. <laughs> so you're in that. Also, just a lot of mood issues can start to come up around anxiety and depression and irritability. Mood swings are really common. And I think people have a lot of guilt over that, thinking that it's like a mind over matter thing. When it's really biochemistry, your body is overloaded and things like serotonin, dopamine, um, these become dysregulated and your thoughts and your mood is going, they're going to change as a result. Don't feel a lot of guilt. You know, don't beat yourself up for this. Just see it as a symptom, as part of this picture that commonly can come with that overload. So that's one. And we're getting to the glucose question, Tina, I promise. Uh, so the other one I want to talk about too is just the hormonal piece for both men and women. We can see changes in uh, libido starts to decline, right? We can see for women, uh, premenopausally, menstrual cycles get all out of whack. You maybe stop ovulating, you maybe go into a PCOS picture, but ovulation is dysregulated, fertility may become dysregulated. If you are someone who's starting to check off these boxes as you're listening, right? Then you're like, okay, time to pay attention to this. These are all signs that you, your stress response system is not working right. And where that ties into glucose um, is, I think of it like this, your stress response system, uh, the neuroendocrine system, it includes a lot of things. It includes all of your endocrine glands and your nervous system and your glucose regulation is controlled by your stress response period or system period. It's controlled by your stress response system. Yes. So controlled by your neuroendocrine system, which means any dysregulation you've got going on in that stress response, in those different uh, axes of the HPA or the HPG or your adrenal and thyroid axis, all this stuff, right? it's going to uh, either directly or indirectly impact glucose potentially. So what we see for people in an acute stress situation, so you've, you've just narrowly avoided like a bad car accident. <gasps> okay, your cortisol is gonna spike, your glucose is gonna spike probably in that situation. And as cortisol spikes, it drags glucose with it because that's just part of how the body has adapted to make fuel very readily available for you in a situation of high stress. So that's an acute stress situation. But if we expand that to a chronic stress picture where now you're in this like super stressed place all the time or in high frequency, now, this is when it's going to get interesting with glucose because you can see a few different things start to happen. One, you can see a chronic elevation, and this is where we talk about prediabetes and diabetes risk, and that's very common, but something that I think a lot of people don't look for as much, but is common for the chronic stress people who have really been in that place for a long time, they're starting to fatigue they're starting to get some serious pain syndromes come up. They're starting to go into these crash cycles, um, which with chronic fatigue syndrome, we call them uh, post-exertional malaise, um, PM triggers, but you know we kind of informally call them crashes, but it's basically when you hit that overload mark and you just collapse, you just feel like, like all of your symptoms, whatever they are, flare in that moment and you crash out. So if you're starting to notice those crash cycles come up and things like that, you're starting to get to the point where now we're in a more advanced picture of stress decompensation over time. And so for glucose in those situations, you can get some really interesting and paradoxical responses where I see a lot of reactive hypoglycemia, which is where someone maybe eats, maybe sees a little bit of glucose elevation, but then their glucose falls and drops and tanks out and falls to a point lower than where it was before they ate. Yeah. So, you know, here's where it was. 
maybe it spiked a little bit or rose a little bit, and now here's where it is afterwards. So reactive hypoglycemia is really common in this group, and some people believe that it's because the part of your stress response system that is in charge of regulating your glucose is no longer working very well, and it has a hard time. There can be changes in... Um, Mechanistically, it can get a little complicated, but there's there can be changes in receptor function. There can be all sorts of just ways that your body has tried to conserve energy by not allocating funding for certain functions, and they haven't really been maintained very well. I think of it as like a house falling into disrepair. It's not going to handle a gust of wind as well. Well, it's not. That's what's happening. You're a rubber band that's been stretched out, and it's not bouncing back as well. So that reactive hypoglycemia pattern can be very common. And then you can also see chronic hypoglycemia, especially in the first half of the day. Um, oh. People who have a lot of trouble tolerating fasting, people who have a lot of trouble being able to get through the night without waking up having to eat, um, a lot of feeling like blood sugar is just, oh, you know, tanking during the day. Um, and this is where you see these paradoxical responses of now I've hit you with a stressor. And instead of your glucose going up and down, it may just go down. And your body isn't able to mount the same kind of response uh, due to the deeper dysregulations in that stress response system that have happened over time. So all of my like very advanced chronic fatigue syndrome folks and people like that um, they have a really hard time with hypoglycemia and they're trying to get out of that hypoglycemia funk that is often more common in the first part of the day. Yes, that's it to a T. I've lived it. I feel yeah. it. <laughs> I know what yeah. it feels like. And you you can't see it. Into, I mean, to have lived with it for decades and watched it worsen and worsen and to not be able to see it until more recently when I slapped a CGM on. And I was like, Oh, that's what I'm seeing, you know, and then you can actually do something about it, which is so phenomenal to be able to address that and do something, you know, have, ha again, it's just knowledge. It's like GI Joe, right? <laughs> right? Like knowing is half the battle. I think that. Oh, half the battle. <laughs> oh Tina, and speaking of, you know what this makes me think of too, and this is a cool story to share um, for people who are in this combo of struggling with the stress overload, but also trying to lose weight. What I often see is they have trouble justifying eating food when they really need to eat food, but having the CGM on and seeing how their glucose will tank. And I'm over here telling them, you've got to eat something. And they're like, I'm going to gain weight. I'm like, no, you need to eat something because if you don't, your whole neuroendocrine system, which also governs your weight, is going to get so messed up. You're not going to lose the weight anyway. Yep. And so when they see that data and they can see, oh my gosh, my glucose is actually tanking that first half of the day when I've been fasting, when I haven't been eating, because I've been worried about losing weight. And you can see, yeah, the reason you feel awful in part is because your glucose is in the gutter for that first part of the day. And see, you do need to eat. And they're like, Oh, wow. Okay. So it's a great way for people to have that feedback on not just coming from me telling them, but from them seeing the data and it confirming what I'm telling them about that glucose needing to be supported. Because if your glucose drops too low, that is a stress on your body. By definition, it is. And it yeah. sets off. So I purposely did this. I purposely went to my old ways, which is just don't eat all day, basically. And I purposely yeah. did it for two, I, about two and a half days. I kind of pulled my old college ways out because I'm pretty good at not eating. And I, it literally destroyed my glucose response for like three days. I was in this hypoglycemic realm the whole day. It didn't matter. And that reactive hypoglycemia kept happening. And I was like, oh, this is why I felt like shit in my twenties and felt like a psycho. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As I was riding this horrible line, it was probably, you know, it was probably more up and down then. Cause I had a actual, I had some pancreatic impact left. Right, but... <laughs> right. You still have something in the tank left. <laughs> yeah. 
but yes, I mean, this all goes back to adrenal glands and your overall, like you said, your neuroendocrine health system. And so it was, I, this last round on the CGM, I was like, I'm literally going to pull out every old bad habit I have, you know, I'm going to disrupt my sleep. I'm going to, what's also interesting is watching that glucose go up in response to stress. And I've talked about this on past episodes. It's just like, just the anticipation. So I live out in the country. So if I'm going somewhere there's some anticipation. We're going to the airport or we're going to an event. It's a drive. It's a yeah. good hour long drive. And so, and my husband's so funny when he takes me anywhere, he always drives and he's very serious about my safety. So he's got to be <laughs> on like target. We can't have any fun until we're there, you know? And so that <laughs> kind of stresses me out. And my glucose goes whoop on my CGM and just anticipatory stress, no food in the gullet, just yep. Or if my sleep is a disaster, the next day is a complete disaster on the CGM. Yes. It's all over yes. the place. It's up all in over the place. You can really see it. It's amazing what poor sleep will do to wreak havoc on your glucose. Yes. That following day. And uh, what you described though, about just the stress causing that elevation, I see it all the time. The non-food glucose influencers and the, the way that, yeah, driving, um, What's really interesting is I did an experiment when I had the CGM on where I tested my same meals at the same time of day, but I decided to do stressful work while I was eating on one day and then get away from the screen, get away from work and eat just focused on the food on other days, totally different meal response. My glucose rose higher when I was eating while I was trying to multitask and do work and do all these other things and answer stressful emails. And it's like, this is what people are doing every day. All <laughs> day long. All day. And oh, it's crazy. Going to be totally different with the same food in the same time. And that was really cool for me to see, because I kind of suspected it might be, but I didn't expect to see it as much as it was. What a great experiment what to control for all those variables. Yeah. It's wild. You know, my, my husband is like everyone else. He just stands there and eats while he's talking to me in the middle of something. I'm like, you have to sit down. Your yes. stomach does not have teeth. The, your body thinks a tiger's chasing you. <laughs> just sit, <laughs> you sit, just sit down. You're killing yourself. <laughs> and he just doesn't get it. They don't people it's been, it's like you mentioned a culturally where we are at, you know, it's just that go, 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 like eat while you're driving eat while you're having a stressful meeting, whatever. It's like, no, take that, yeah. at least give yourself a few minutes each day to in, enjoy the nourishment. I like to sit outside if it's sunny. I live in Oregon where it's hardly sunny, but if it is, it's like, I'm out there with my dog. We're having a nice mm-hmm. time. I might, I'm a slow eater. I might take 45 minutes to get down a small amount of food. I'm just like, I'm chilling. That's and, great. That's yeah. Ideal. Yeah. yeah. Ever since seeing that too, I really just cut myself off from working while I was eating. Now, no matter how busy I am and what I have going on, I leave the room, I leave my office, I go into another room, I eat, I don't have work in front of me. And I, and it's, I just like decided I needed to do that. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Well, this has been so enlightening and I, everything you said, you know, I've, I, I, it's funny. I, I admit this. I know all of this in the back of my head. I teach this. I've taught this to my patients and yet for ourselves to, to live it. Right. We have to, I'm a big, big proponent of walking my talk. And so I do put that CGM on every few months just to kind of check myself and see where I'm at and not let myself get too far off course. I think it's a really great investment for folks to do a couple times a year, at least even those of us who think we're so dialed in and, you know, we've got it all figured out. It's valuable for us as well, because you just, we can't mitigate all these stressful factors happening in the world and uh, we can't control all the variables. So this is really good information for my audience. I appreciate you. Oh yeah, no, this has been a blast. I've loved hearing more of your story too. And just hearing like your thoughts on this topic. I feel like we could talk about it for hours because it's so interesting for both of us and so relevant for both of us having personally kind of gone through these similar things. But yeah, I've, I've just really appreciated this time and it's been awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Tina. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you have to come back. We'll have to do a whole episode on central sensitization. And like, oh, I love that. Go into the biochemistry of it because I think people could, that would be enlightening for folks. I think a lot of folks are living with it and unaware of it and really beating themselves over it because they just don't quite 
you know, get what's going on. So anyway, 100%. I actually, I think that more, I, I would say, um, most, it's hard to put a, a quantified number on it, but I would say just a vast number of people are living with this that have no idea about it. Even things like chronic fatigue syndrome, which is now the terminology is changing a little bit, but the CDC estimates that something close to 90% of people are undiagnosed. So yeah. here you are dealing with all this stuff that does have a biological reason and rationale behind it. And it's not your fault, right? But we're, these people are made to feel like it's in their head. It's all this other stuff and it's their fault and they just need to push through. They need to get over it. I see it all the time. I see it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. And most of my naturopathic colleagues have no idea that this exists. Most oh, yeah. of the chiropractors, even though we were taught it, I paid attention intimately. Cause I was like, Oh, he's describing my life. But uh, even my, a lot of my chiropractor colleagues don't have a lot of reverence for it. So I, you know, this isn't something that's even familiar in the alternative health world. So it's great to have a resource like you to, we'll, we'll talk blood sugar and central sensitization. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just love it because I can so rarely talk to someone who really knows and gets it and is into it. I often have to do kind of a uh, like a, a generic skirting of the periphery and I can't really do as much of a deep dive with someone. So I'm thrilled to have that opportunity with you. And anytime you want to talk shop, I'm down for it. Awesome. Okay. Well, Heather Davis, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I really appreciate your insight. I hope everybody listening will seriously consider getting a continuous glucose monitor, if even for that two week period, I think that it is such an eye opener for folks, especially those of us who like the burn the candle at both ends. So thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much, Tina. All right. <laughs>